and we're recording. Um, this is the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum Oral History Project. My name is Hannah Nordhaus. I'm interviewing Jerry Haynes. Um, and it's the 13th of October, 2003, and we're at the um, Reynolds Branch Library in Boulder. So, um, to begin, why don't you just tell me a little bit about your background, um, where you grew up, what your parents did, schooling, that sort of thing. Okay. I was born in Kansas, northwestern Kansas, and lived on a farm in Kansas until I was in the sixth grade. <clears throat> then my parents moved to uh, Longmont, and then a few years after that moved to Boulder. I grew up in Boulder, graduated from Boulder High, attended college for a few years, and then I went to work at Rocky Flats. So uh, that was your first job? Well, I had some part-time jobs uh, in high school and shortly after, but that's about it. Um, and I understand your father worked at Rocky Flats. Too. That's correct. Yeah, my dad started uh, probably when I was in high school or shortly before, maybe junior high. So. Was that why you moved to this area? <clears throat> that's why we moved to Boulder. Didn't want to commute from Longmont because that was a significant commute back in those days, in the early 50s. There wasn't the diagonal highway? The diagonal highway did not exist. So how did you have to, how did you get there? Uh, he drove through Lafayette, and then uh, through Louisville, and then over to Highway 93, and that way, so. Okay, okay um, so what, what did he do at Rocky Flat? Uh, he was a, a foreman in the pit assembly group. They put the final product together. Did you know what he did <clears throat> when you were growing up? Uh, no, I did not. I, uh, after I got, went to work, he was still at work when I went to work, and so uh, that's when I began to realize what his job was. So I assume um you first learned about Rocky Flats because your dad went to work there. Yeah, that's that's basically uh, where it all started. My dad worked there, and I kind of knew when they had job opportunities or when they didn't. And so he would tell me, if you're interested, they're hiring. Did you know that it was a atomic plant, or what did you know? About I did know atomic? that it was an atomic plant, and. I think I had suspicions it was associated with nuclear weapons, but that's about as much as I knew about it. Until you started working there? Yes. And when was that? I started to work April 4th, 1962. Oh. Oh, and uh, what was your first job there? Uh, what was called a radiation monitor. I uh, started off my first day, I was one, and I didn't know what one was, <laughs> <laughs> but I was one. Uh, <clears throat> They had a shortage of them at that time. Uh, they needed people with a college background, at least a significant science and math background. And they had a hard time filling those positions back then, so I fit right in, I guess. What was your college? What did you study science and math in college? Yeah, chemistry. Mm -hmm. So as a radiation monitor, what was your job description? Basically to help the production processes control the radiation and the contamination associated with plutonium or uranium. So were you, did you <coughs> wand all the um, workers? Was that what, and you go through the rooms and? That was part of the job, yes. Most of the job consisted of working on either project, production operations, supporting them while they did their work, or maintenance activities to maintain the production equipment. And how long did you do that for? Uh, about eight years, I believe. <clears throat> and then I took a salaried position. The previous position was an hourly position within the union. And then I took a salaried position as a technician. Um, so what did you do there? As a technician, I was basically sort of technical support to the radiation monitoring organization. I would uh, do studies of various types, 
from new instrumentation to uh, evaluate how current processes were working or procedures to see if they were effective, that sort of thing. And then? Then <clears throat> I moved into management mm -hmm. and supervised the, the health physics or radiation monitor technicians and did that for several years. Uh, moved from that back into management in a different area of radiation safety associated with the radiation monitors as they were called then. Now they're called RCTs or radio radiation control technologists. Mm -hmm. So I supervised a bunch of hourly people for several years and then I went into a training group health and safety training and did all organized and managed that. Did that for several years, then I retired and went to work the next day for Wackenhut, the security firm where I'm currently employed. So it, what is your job with Wackenhut? I'm the director of health and safety. So they, they do security <clears throat> but they also have safety responsibilities? Everything from radiation safety to industrial safety, firearm safety, all that sort of thing. Okay. How do and, and only for Wackenhut employees or for everybody? For Wackenhut employees. Um, how did you become Mr. Safety? <laughs> That's a good question. It sort of found me, I guess. I started off in the radiation safety field, which is, uh, you know, just one of the branches of safety and just kind of grew up along those lines. I guess because I had the technical background to get started in it. <clears throat> was something you were particularly interested in as compared to other aspects of the work at Rocket Cats? You know, the radiation safety part of it was very interesting and very challenging and I really enjoyed it. And so it was a good, good match. And so I enjoyed it and had no desire to change. Um, so when did you ever get to work along, near your father, alongside your father? Or? Yes, yeah, sometimes, especially in the early years when I was still hourly, uh -huh. I would support some of the activities that his people were performing. and My dad would be around from time to time. Was that enjoyable? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, when you came to work there, was it what it, you expected from what your impressions of your father's work? <clears throat> Not at all. I had no idea that uh, the physical layout of the place was like it was. It, when I was first exposed to a plutonium process area, I was sort of flabbergasted. You, it's something that would be hard to describe. Rows and rows and rows of glove box systems all tied together with individual operations and all of these glove boxes that do numerous things inside of them. So you were flabbergasted at the scale of it or at the sort of degree of uh, instrumentation? Well, <clears throat> literally the way it was done through the glove box system and the scale of it because there were huge buildings that were just nothing but glove boxes, rows and rows of them, all tied together, starting with one operation leading to another operation leading to another operation all in a sort of an assembly line kind of operation or process. Mm -hmm. hmm. it, it was quite large physically yet many of the things you did was not on a very large scale at all. Right. Did, They're little parts, right? Didn't necessarily need to be. Yeah. Um, I might skip forward a little bit while okay. you're talking about this. Um, one of, I have a <clears> set of questions about the buildings, which you might have seen, and um, part of the reason we're asking these questions is because um, we're hoping to do some work with the State Historical Fund, which does historic preservation stuff, and mm -hmm. we're, um, you know, obviously this can't be preserved, so mm -hmm. we're hoping to preserve the memories of these buildings. All right. Um, so you, you've sort of gotten at this, but I'm just, 
wondering if you could tell me what it was like to work in those buildings. Well, the first building I worked in, <coughs> which was building 776, and it's scheduled to be one of the last buildings to come down, I think. But it was different from the other buildings in a lot of the way. In fact, that it was one large open space all tied together with the glove box system. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> you could literally walk from one end to the other of the building, which was several hundred feet, through a maze of glove boxes that did various operations. It was not a particularly good layout because if you had an incident of some sort in one corner of the building, it, it could in, end up involving the whole building, which it did when we had the fire in 1969. Newer buildings were modular, modularized so that you could uh, have a particular aspect of the process uh, contained within one area. And it is also good from a radiation safety point of view as in the fact that it isolated one process from the other and you could minimize the effects of any incident. Were the walls reinforced with something to, I mean, it, there must have been materials that are better for dealing with contamination than others? Most of the walls were drywall construction, uh, painted with a good good sealant mm -hmm. so that if, if they did become contaminated it was fairly easy to clean them up. Usually it wasn't the walls you had to worry about, it was the floor and the horizontal surfaces. Because? Yeah, yeah. plutonium is a very heavy metal, it'll settle out. Right. So it's more about people tracking stuff around. And, and That's true. That's correct. Although the ventilation system could move it somewhat. <clears throat> um, did the um, buildings and the processes function as they were initially intended? I mean, in the, like if you took a blueprint of the building and then took the building as it was when production stopped, um, I'm just wondering how, what sort of changes were made to the buildings and um, well. who had input into those changes? I had some input into that, but <clears throat> as the buildings started, there were really two kinds of buildings out there. One, metal processing buildings, and the others were wet chemistry buildings. Where the, the wet chemistry, the purpose was to recover plutonium from the waste streams. Mm -hmm. Plutonium being a very valuable metal. Uh, the metal handling facilities were where components were produced for the pits. Uh, the wet chemistry buildings tended to be a little more modularized from the start, and I really don't know the reasons behind that. Uh, as I said, the metal handling facilities were not. But over time, when Building 707 was built, for instance, it was sort of a next generation for 776 building. It was very modularized. In fact, the rooms were called Module A, Module B, etc., mm -hmm. for various activities that took place in in those modules, starting with foundry operations and machining operations and assembly operations, and so they held different aspects of the production process as they went along. The last building to be built out there was building 371. It was a wet chemistry building, but did have some metal handling capabilities as well. It was probably our most advanced from a safety point of view. I don't think the process worked out as well as they had hoped in the original design. Never really got a chance to test it out for they decided to shut the plant down. And you see the process, you mean the... The production the process. Um, how, what were the, the safety um, advances 
371? <clears throat> well, again, we very much made a purposeful study out of how to modularize the facility to control the contamination. Mm -hmm. The shielding for penetrating radiation was very thorough. Uh, so that uh, radiation exposure to penetrating radiation like x-rays, mm -hmm. etc., would be much less. And that was the, like shielding on the glove boxes and stuff? Yeah, the glove boxes were shielded in a much better fashion than, than the older glove boxes were in, in, in the older buildings. So they are easier to work in. You could get more work done with less radiation exposure. Contamination control was much better. It was designed such that if there was a spill, there was no places, there were not places that you could not get to to not clean up, which many of the old buildings uh, trapped contamination in places that made it very difficult to clean up. This building was in, designed with that in mind, not only by not allowing those places to be designed in where you, they became traps, but also surface finishes, epoxy finishes on floors and walls and wherever it was needed mm -hmm. so that they were easily scrubbed down if necessary. Um, were some of the old buildings retrofitted to have these? To a certain degree, yes. Yes, they were. but. Uh, uh, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. You know, some of them, <laughs> the best you could do was not that good. Right. And so a lot of the processes, the improvements in the, in the safety, in the materials and stuff, was that, was that some trial and error? Advances? A little bit of both. A lot of it was trial and error. You know, when the plant first started out there, it was basically the first one of its kind. I mean, there were other pits that had been built but never on a production scale like that. Mm -hmm. And so to handle massive amounts of plutonium on a production basis had, had never been done before. So how you do that was a learning process. A long process. A long right? learning process, yeah. So why did, why, um, did the processes, the production processes in um, building 371 not work as well as I really don't know the real answer to that. Uh, not being a production specialist myself, but more of a safety specialist, I don't really know for sure. I think they tried so much to automate a wet chemistry process that involved acids and some very corrosive materials and automated systems sometimes don't work as well under those conditions, and I think that that had some of the things to do with it. Plus it was, you know, they tried new things, and new things don't always work. Back to the trial and error. Right. Um, did workers have a degree of input to change the way processes worked at the plant? Probably not so much in the early days, but well, I don't even know if that's true because, you know, I came out of the early days, basically, and I had a lot of input into some of the upgrades and designs. I mean, that's what, that's what I did. That's what some of the groups that I supervised did. That's what their purpose was, was to review new engineering packages and to see that radiation safety considerations were taken into account. And when people approach you and say, you know, I'm working on this line and <clears throat> this could work better if we did it this way, and, and was there that sort of give and take? Probably not as much from, from the people on the floor. They would tend to go to the technical groups and ask them to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually they came to that, but I don't know if it really started off that way. Um. If you could describe a typical day at work at Rocky Flats in terms of the buildings, so what involved getting into the buildings, getting out the different clothing mm -hmm. you had to wear, that sort of thing. Just to, I know probably your typical work day changed as your job description changed. Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. Um, 
first you came in to the plant through the security and you had to get on the plant side first and then you had to go down and park your car go through a security building again and in the early days you went through a guard post at the building itself and had to go through security again then you went into the locker room changed out of your street clothes into your work clothes which basically was a complete change of clothes including underwear, shoes, socks and into a pair of coveralls and a skull cap or a surgeon's cap then when you went in the back area to work you donned a pair of surgeon's gloves uh, to protect your hands from skin contamination. You carried a respirator with you in the early days. They don't do that anymore. Uh, then you went back in the area, or went, basically you went through your, through your office and got your assignment for the morning, the afternoon, the whole day, whatever. And then picked up, in my case, instrumentation back when I was a radiation monitor, pick up the instrumentation uh, and go back and do your work in the process area. In the process area you would add some shoe covers so that you wouldn't contaminate your shoes, which was a possibility. Were you street shoes? Did you have another set of shoes too? Yeah, safety shoes with steel toes. And then did your work. And then as a radiation monitor come break time I'd go to the exit points and as people come out of the back area you would scan them for contamination. And then they would go out and have a break, repeat the process until noon. Then at noon they come out, change their clothes uh, before they went to eat, got on fresh clean coveralls and everything, went to the cafeteria or wherever, had their lunch, and then back to work. So that's basically how the day went. And then how about the end of the day? End of the day, scanned people out. Uh, they went into the locker room, showered, cleaned, got a thorough shower, and then went home. Back through all the security. <laughs> and were there a lot of I, I, my record? I've just been on site a few times, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of loudspeakers and. Oh know, yeah. What, how are the sights and sounds? Well, obviously the sights. How are the sounds different than in a typical workplace? In the early days, you you, ne you never heard many announcements over the speaker system. Today, it's not a day goes by that you don't hear at least one announcement of some sort. Uh, but tied into those systems were various alarm systems for fire alarms or radiation alarms of one kind or another or possibly even a planned announcement about the upcoming Christmas party. Did the alarms have different sounds? Yeah, they all had different sounds and you had to go through those uh, uh, you have to take a class on what those sounds are and what and what your response is to them. Was there for radiation? Anytime anybody got even a little bit of contamination, was there an alarm? Not not typically. Uh, sometimes, if the radiation or the contamination would get airborne, there would be monitors that monitored the air, and they would sound a, a, a local alarm. But. Uh, <clears throat> A lot of times people would come out with some very low level contamination on their clothing. It wasn't that unusual. So then they had to go to the a room inside the process area and change from one set of coveralls to the other. But it's, if, it's not, if it wasn't on their skin, they didn't have to do anything? Typically, no. Just change their clothes. Change their coveralls, typically, that was it. Um. Tell me about the work environment at the plant in terms of, you know, between workers and supervisors and um, 
how that environment may have changed during different eras. In the, in the early days with Dow Chemical, when I first started, there was a lot of camaraderie. It was a challenge, you know. This was a new, new field, new openings, lots of unknowns. Lots of things to challenge you and lots of things to work on. And people took it as a challenge. And then there were a lot of very tight-knit organizations, especially the one I was in. The Radiation Monitoring Group, Radiation Safety People, were really a tight organization. They, they hung together and supported each other a lot. And most of the other groups were similar, maybe not to the degree that one was. But over time, there began to be some difficulties between the Union and Dow Chemical. And Dow Chemical was a very good production-oriented company. They knew how to get the job done. They probably weren't the best at, at employee relations. And I think that's why their contract eventually while they were told they could bid on the new contract, they chose not to, which was probably a good thing for both, both parties, including DOE. When Rockwell came in, Rockwell was a very, I think Rockwell was given a mandate to improve, improve employee relations. Um, I don't know that, that's just my conclusion. <clears throat> but. They weren't as good at getting the pr production done as Dow was. And it seemed like forever we were fighting schedules, not quite getting the job, the product on the, out the gate in time, in all kinds of arenas. But they were a very good company to work for. They brought in a lot of new benefits. Uh, tried to be employee-oriented. In many ways, I think they gave away the farm because for a long time after that, the company didn't run Rocky Flats, the union did. And that was not necessarily all bad, but not necessarily good either. You had a hard time deciding who was gonna make the decision if there was uh, something up for consideration and they were at opposite ends, the union would end up in Washington, D.C., and they're very much liable to win the outcome. They had more votes than management did. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, then EGG came in, a company I didn't particularly like at all. They were there to make as much money as they could, as fast as they could, and that's what they did, and then they left. Didn't like their management style, didn't like the company, and don't like them, still don't today. Mm -hmm. At the end of EG&G's term, I took an offered buyout in 1992. Took the buyout. And at that time, Wack and Hutt was a separate contractor, so I went to work for them. That was a whole new environment for me. I mean, I'd not been in security at all. Knew all the security guards, but didn't really know all the things they did, nor appreciate all the things that they did. Wackenut was, for me, a very good company to go to work for, and still is. Uh, I'll enjoy it until the end, which is not that far away. Kaiser Hill, obviously you haven't worked for them, but what's your perception of the, the environment under Kaiser Hill? Kaiser Hill is a very efficient company, not very interested in people, but are interested in the bottom line. They're very much dollar oriented. Uh, they will meet schedules. There is no doubt about it. If they say they're going to be out of there by 2006, you can bet it'll probably be 2005. 
I imagine it's a different um, workplace atmosphere as well, just because the job is very different. Right? Job is very different now for the, for the workers in the area. Yes, uh, it involves dealing with high levels of contamination all the time because they're in the process of tearing these 50 years worth of equipment down. And so they've got to get rid of all that. So today they're wearing a higher, much higher level of anti-contamination clothing. That's what it's called, anti-seas. And uh, many of them spend a lot of hours in a respirator. Some of them spend a lot of hours with supplied breathing air. It's hard work, it's difficult work, very demanding. Um, one question I have, it seems that nobody has a very good impression of EG&G, &G, and I'm wondering um, whether part of that is um, that it was such a difficult time for the plant. It was a difficult time. It was. They came on the heels of the fiasco of the FBI raid, mm -hmm. and the loyal opposition was trying to shut the plant down. Uh, they were trying to start it up and get it back into operation. Um, lots of roadblocks were thrown up. It was uh, a difficult time. But all that aside, you think it wasn't the right company to get the I don't know if they really, uh, enough said. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about the union. Now, it sounds like you, you saw the unions from both sides, right? Because you started out in the mm -hmm. union and then became management. Um, I was w wondering if you could tell me um, if, if you feel that the union had much importance or impact there and um, maybe the good and, and positive and negative aspects of its predominance. The union uh, had and still has a lot of influence. And I'm primarily talking about the steel workers. Uh, the guards have a separate union mm -hmm. just for the guards. Um, the union had a lot of positive influence in the early days. Uh, the safety requirements didn't exist. There were no regulations to any great degree that said this is what you must do or this is the limit to which you must control it. There were limits but they were not, not to the degree that they needed to be. And the union pushed that it, uh, uh, pushed a lot of safety issues and in the long run were partially responsible for getting them changed and that was a good thing. But they also had more control than many, many things and from a political perspective and didn't necessarily do things because it was the right thing to do but because it would bring in more time and a half money or a larger membership with more dues paying members or I think they, at some point in time they lost track of what was the right thing to do. They became a big business just like the big business they were working for. And you think that's just a function of? I think that's a normal function almost anywhere. Size and history. And Mm -hmm. establishment in their place. Yeah, exactly. Did they still um, do good things for their members at the end? Or? In, a, in a facility like Rocky Flats, I believe a union is necessary. And they still take care of their membership and they do good things for them as they should. I'm not sure that 
I agree with all their decisions and I'm not sure that they would, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't agree with mine, sometimes. Mm -hmm. But in general, yeah, they need to be there. Did you personally have a lot of interaction with the union? I would imagine with the safety stuff. Yes. Uh, in the early days when I was a union member, not so much. I was not a active member. I was on some of the committees and stuff to promote job training and that sort of thing. But that was about it. When I was on the other side of the fence in, in management, then uh, some of the safety issues brought up by the union then came to me to deal with. And most of them were legitimate. Many of them were frivolous, but I would say a majority of them were well-founded. What, what, can you give an example of frivolous versus well-founded? Somebody who is not a particularly good employee and wants to be paid for a bunch of overtime that they didn't work but feel like there was a improper procedure followed or something like that so in an attempt to punish the company they'd want 40 hours of back pay at time and a half. Because someone else did their job or something like that? Any number of reasons. And it wasn't all that unusual for that to happen. So that's frivolous. And then what's you said? Do you think well-founded? Oh yeah, there. Well, uh, many times the level of control in the safety arena, be it radiation safety or or whatever, was not what it should have been or could have been easily because it may have cost time and money. And so the union rightfully said, let's, let's fix this. This needs to be better than this. We, need, we don't need this level of risk. And so they would pursue that. like for you to work in such high security um, and to be cleared for it and to not be able to discuss your work with your family and, um, and that sort of thing? Most of the work that I did was not classified. So I, I didn't deal with the classification to the level that other people did. A lot of people, the very things that they did were very classified and the paperwork that they handled was classified. and. So you couldn't talk about that. Um, the stuff I did was on the edge of that so that I didn't have to deal with the security aspects of my job where were minim minimal compared to a lot of them, such as my dad's. Mm -hmm. so, so could you tell your family what you did? I could tell them that I dealt with radiation safety. Mm -hmm. So, and my wife worked at Rocky Flats for a while, so she had a basic understanding of what went on out there. So it wasn't, wasn't difficult for me. It may have been much more so for others. And I imagine you grew up in an environment where you're, you didn't know what your father did, so it didn't seem strange to you either. That's, that's probably true. That's correct, yeah. Um, what was your experience at, of paperwork like at Rocky Plus? Was there an inordinate amount of paperwork that you got? For some things there, there were. Uh, the, the Department of Energy is very much a government organization and, and we're a, subcon or a contractor to them. Mm -hmm. And so they have rules and requirements about how you document things and if you want to do things, how you, how you go through the process. So yes, there's a lot of paperwork there. Uh, 
Again, in the safety field, it's probably not as much so as in some other areas. But having spent practically all my working life at Rocky Flats, I wouldn't know any other system. So I don't have anything to compare it to. Um, <clears throat> why don't you tell me, you touched on the 69 fire and the FBI raid. Um, mm -hmm. I assume you don't have any direct recollection to the 57 fire since you weren't there. I do know some about the, there was some residual contamination within the building in 57 when I started there in 62 that people would warn you about. This was the room where the fire started, you know, and so you have to be careful with contamination control and that sort of thing. And so that, that part of it I was familiar with. And I've read some history of it, but not directly involved. Well, how about the 69 fire? What's your... Um... Well, that was, so it worked out for me in several incidents at Rocky Flats. 69 fire, I was out of town that day. It was on Mother's Day, which was a Sunday, I believe, and then, um, I was somewhere completely out of town. I don't even remember where, but I didn't even know about it till I came home and saw on the 10 o'clock news that night that there had been a major fire at Rocky Flats. Didn't have a clue. So I learned about it initially the way everybody else did. Um, at that time I was uh, one of two radiation safety technicians in a research building, building 779. And so while it was only slightly affected by the fire, it was to a small degree. So that was my assignment for the next period of time until they decided they needed to expand their salaried ranks and so then I went salaried into a technical position and so I didn't deal much with the, that particular fire the, directly as a worker. I dealt more with it from a reporting, documenting kind of aspect. So you said you were in your job in your building in 779? Mm-hmm. You were then assigned, you said it, was only, it wasn't really affected by the fire, but... It was it slightly. By contamination, or...? Yes. It was connected to building 7677, which is one big structure, uh -huh. by a tunnel. Some contamination came down that tunnel and into a couple of rooms. So what was your job in? To uh, assist with the decontamination of that building, which only took a few months. Well, not even that. I think probably a month at most. What did you, what did you how did you assist? Well, I was a radiation technician, so surveyed, located the contamination, followed the cleanup crew as they cleaned it up, and then assured that it was clean when they, when they did. If not, well, scrub it some more. How did they scrub it? What did they use? Uh, they had a solution that was basically uh, soap and water and uh, paper towels. And you'd uh, put the solution down on the floor if necessary or just take damp rags and wipe it down. And uh, then dry it up and then, then you go in and survey it and see if you got it all. And, and then just move forward towards, towards a, from the lowest level of contamination towards the higher levels. And when you got it all, you got it all. Um, Plus, you know, you have to check things like make sure there's nothing airborne and all that sort of thing to any excessive degree. Of course, you're wearing respiratory protection and increased levels of uh, clothing and that sort of thing to protect a worker. Um, so that's the 69 fire. Mm -hmm. um, so there are other instances where were you also out of town? 
the FBI raid turned out to be the same way. Really? Yeah, exactly the same way. Didn't find out about that actually until I came to work Monday morning. That was sort of a scary thing in looking back at it because people were not allowed on that plant site carrying weapons. And on come the FBI, all of them carrying weapons, some of them carrying machine guns. Something stupid could have happened real easily. Were you, did you have to um, interact with them? From, cause some of their cons the complaints were safety related. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. They never talked to me very much. Uh, they mostly were talking to the supervision above me. Mm -hmm. I provided some documentation of some things, but uh, very little interaction with them. What did you think about the raid? It was political. Uh, their accusations were incorrect. One of the things they said was we were burning an, in, an incinerator to dispose of waste. Well, that incinerator had been shut down and never and not operated when they said it was. And I know for a fact that it wasn't operated because my organization's one of their responsibilities was to monitor that operation, and it wasn't running. But they didn't believe that. They said they could detect heat coming out the exhaust stack of Building 771. Well, sure you can. Chemi chemistry operation in that building gives off heat. The building itself is heated. I mean, uh, heat will come out of that exhaust stack. It's going to be considerably warmer than the ambient temperatures around it. And uh, I don't know. Of course, nobody wanted to believe Rocky Flats, and so they took their lumps on that one. Rockwell took a lot of lumps on that. They paid millions of dollars in fines just to get out of it. They're a government contractor primarily, and they don't want to be involved in a big fight with the government because it will affect their contracts. Do you feel that any of the complaints were valid? You know, it's hard to say. Were they living by the standards that were in place in that point in time? The answer is yes. Were they living by the standards that are existing today? No. Which ones are the right standards? Uh, you look at what Dow Chemical did. Dow Chemical was absolutely operating by the standards of the day, by the requirements, the rules, and regulations. However, they certainly would be way out of place in today's world. But they weren't doing anything wrong. The, the standards were not what they needed to be, and the technology had not told us that yet. Do you, um, do you think having the looser standards, I mean, do people know this is bad, or did they not even know that? It just, I mean, so we're going by the letter of the law versus there's nothing wrong with it. The technology hadn't told us that things needed to be different. And it was it existed in all kinds of ways. I mean, not just how you operate, but environmental regulations, how you handle waste. All of those things are so different today, requirements-wise, the way we do things. If you look back at the way things were when I first started there, you think, my God, this is terrible. But it was exactly the way that it needed to be done. If Dow Chemical would have went to Congress or to DOE and said, we need 50 million more dollars to do this because it's the right thing to do, DOE, the Congress, and the people of the United States would have laughed in their face because there was no requirement to, to do anything more than they were doing. Um, how did you feel about the protests when they happened? And how did 
people you work with feel? Mostly we thought they were stupid. I mean, when you have people out there living in tents, getting into fights, stabbing each other uh, over the railroad tracks, or people who were not, who represented the protesting, the ones you've seen in the newspapers were what I would describe as the village idiot, you know. There were very sincere people in that organization, but I don't think they were well represented. That's what we saw. We thought, what is this? This is dumb. You know, it was just, they didn't do their job any better than we did ours. Of communicating? Yeah. Did you have any direct contact with the protesters? No. Did you um, participate in any of the pro nuclear rallies? I did go to the one they had, uh, the first one they had, I forget what they call it, Power for the People, I think, was a slogan. It was sort of a picnic and a see your buddies and don't remember much about it. Was it, um, did it feel good to have, make a public statement against the protesters or not for them? Yeah, yeah, I probably did. I, um, I don't know. I, I don't know how well reported or coverage. I, I really don't remember too much about it. You have to remember back in those days I was young and single and had a different view of the world. So these things weren't as important? They weren't, exactly. Um, how did you feel when production stopped? Uh, sort of like I felt like about the uh, FBI raid. They were stopped for false reasons. You know, the real reason that they should have been stopped is because the world doesn't need things like that. It would be a better place without them. Mm -hmm. But when they go in and, and say, uh, you're doing a terrible job and things are unsafe and you're poisoning the world and all of this sort of thing when, in fact, you know, by today's standards, maybe we are poisoning the world by the standards that existed then. We weren't. And so you felt like you're being slapped down for something that was, was not correct. Did you think that, um the plant should continue production in that location? I think it could, safely, but politically, n not going to happen, never, it's not possible. So the best thing to do is move on. Not possible because it's too populated? And too no, it's not possible because it's not politically acceptable. Technically, it's possible. Politically, it's not. Te technically, in terms of it doesn't, you don't think it poses a safety risk to the community? The community takes a lot more risks that are a lot higher than that one every day. Such as? Driving their car. Yeah. Um, what do you, do you think, what do you think about the cleanup? Do, do you think it's, um, you know, the refuge is, a good plan for the site and you think it can be cleaned up to yeah. acceptable standards? Yes, I, I, I think it can. Um, at all, I think the standards may be not totally inclusive. I don't know. I'm, I'm not really involved in those, so I don't really know exactly what the requirements are. Uh, like in all things, it's a matter of money. How much money does the American people want to spend on it? Um, I think the current plan that they have is satisfactory. Might be able to be done better. 
probably can, but it's going to take uh, more money. So you have to decide how clean is clean. I think the technology can tell us that. Um, not all the decisions will be made because of technical reasons. Many of them will be political. I think a, a wildlife refuge is a great idea. However, there are some things that are going to go to waste out there that could have very much been useful. We had one of the most advanced machining buildings that machined stainless steel, one of the most advanced uh, in the world. And it's now a building that they store waste in. And what happened to all the, the uh... A lot of them were scrapped. Uh, some of them went to uh, uh, other sites. Uh, probably a machine, uh, machines that are high precision like that, that's set, pretty soon they're ruined. Mm -hmm. They have to be in use. Why is that? Uh, bearings and guides and way, ways on those machines get flat spots from setting. And if you don't use them, and if you weren't allowed to use them, therefore they were probably ruined. a sense that Rocky Flats was a very dangerous place to work. Mm -hmm. uh, you've sort of discussed this already, but um, I wonder if your how, your perception, you know, if you felt that this was ever so, that it was dangerous in any way, and did your perceptions of worker safety change over time as you... As yeah, I, I would agree that back in the, the Dow Chemical days, well, we did not have the degree of control that we have today. And it... And we, the degree of control today is, is really what's needed. Uh, so was it dangerous? I don't know. I worked in those buildings for eight years. I do have some plutonium inside my body. I'm not really worried about it. Uh, Never probably really be able to tell whether it affects me or not. I mean, so many, what is it, one person in four comes down with cancer in their lifetime? What that, you know, how are they going to prove whether one individual or a hundred, whether it was plutonium or their gene pool or whatever? It's hard to do. It's impossible, probably. So that got a lot better as, as time went on in terms of uh, workers being exposed to plutonium? Hey, Abso obviously absolutely. Plutonium, absolutely. How were you exposed? Don't really know. It uh, sort of showed up in the bioassay sample and in the body count. Just one, when did it show up? Probably about 1980 something. So you've been at this point. You weren't working with plutonium anymore. Mm -mm. And you, um, you have you have regular tests, an annual test or something. Yeah, on a regular basis. And and it just show up in your urine or something. Is that how you found out? Shows up in your urine. Shows up in, in a body counter. Or they actually, it's a lung counter. A large steel shielded vault you go into, and they place detectors around your chest cavity. And see if. Uh, and the year before you'd had the same tests and I hadn't shown up. You know, you're dealing with very, very small numbers. Uh, and uh, plus or minus several decimal points makes a difference. And so several counts, maybe, you'll determine that, yeah, those decimal points are not. The fluctuation is not enough, uh, is such that you can determine it's positive or not. 
over time, the count will grow from those detectors because of the nature of the radioactive material associated with plutonium. There's an ingrowth of americium-241, which is what they really count in the body counter. Plutonium, uh, as it decays, part of it becomes americium-241, which is very easy to, de de to detect. Mm -hmm. Consequently, over time, more and more of it grows in there and a little bit of exposure you got many years ago shows up years later. That's what happened in my case. I need to stop the tape. It's in, put it in the way real quick. Oops. And it's the 13th of October, 2003. This is our second tape. Um, and we were just discussing um, exposure to plutonium, mm -hmm. uh, worker safety. And you were telling me about how it happened that your exposure to plutonium showed up years after it probably happened. Um, and you don't have, you know, it's probably, you have no I idea. Were there certain incidents that, where it could have happened or just some? There was some maintenance activities that I'm involved with that the control was less than what it should have been. Um, there was a fire in 76 building before the 69 fire. I can't remember exactly when it happened. It, like I said, it was a big open building. It happened in one part of the building. The rest of the building didn't know it had happened and were walking around without protection. I was there at that time. I was in 76 building when they had the carbon TED explosion. Uh, working in the building at that time as well. Of course, everybody knew when that happened, so. Uh, those are possibilities, don't really know. And when was that, the carbon TED explosion? Prior to the 69 fire, I don't remember the date. And that was, a, everybody knew because it was a big yeah, explosion. Blew the window off of a glove box. Oh, wow. that That's back when you used carbon tet to fight fires, and it exploded. <laughs> Shows you what technology will do for you. Right. The lessons learned. <laughs> yeah, definitely. The hard way. Mm -hmm. So, was there a lot, but there wasn't a lot of contamination in the air at that point? There was a lot of contamination in the air. And mostly fairly localized, but who knows down at the other end of the building whether it was just a little bit or none. But they didn't get you out of the building and put you on respirators? Yeah, put, as soon as I knew about it, I put my respirator on, but I stayed in the building a while to help pe get people out. Um, so, and you've had no adverse health effects that you can tell so far? No. Are you, now that you've had no, I, you have your load of plutonium. Is, um, are you in a monitoring program, or how does that look? Supposed to be, but the funding's been cut off on it. I, they haven't. Uh, they used to call me in every two years and give me a complete physical and, and do the counts. I haven't been called in five years. Who cut off the funding? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know whether it came from DOE or Kaiser Hill and diverted the funding someplace else or what, I really don't know. But evidently they don't have the funding because they're not doing it. Is that something, I know some, some, some of the less healthy workers feel that depending on what they were exposed to depends on how well they're taken care of. Do you have any um, complaints about the fact that you're not being monitored now? Yeah, I think. I think it was something that they thought they should be doing some time ago, and now they're not doing it, and I'm really not sure what the rationale is. If, if there's not a need, they need to tell me. If they're not doing it because of money issues, then sounds like an old problem that we've had for years. Things are not getting taken care of because of money. Are the people 
who've had exposure to plutonium in general, I don't know, someone had, I think, mentioned to me that the ber people who've been exposed to beryllium are very well monitored. Mm -hmm. uh, but the plutonium exposure, since they don't know what's going to happen to you down the line, it's not as, is, is that the case? Beryllium, I think, exposures, people are sensitized to beryllium. And either they're going to have an effect or they're not. Mm -hmm. um, those that are sensitized, we're going to know it right away because they're going to come down with beryllosis. Uh, an immediate effect. Radiation uh, effects are not the same. And in most cases, it will take 20 years or longer for any effect to, to be known. Uh, we have people at, at Rocky Flats that, and retired from Rocky Flats that have a lot more radiation exposure than I do. A lot more. And I don't know of any effects on those people yet, so. What's your exposure? Do, do you have like a, I, I, so it goes up every year, your load? Actually, it's kind of uh, stabilized, which after a certain point in time it will do. It's yeah. what, is, what they say is it re reaches equilibrium, and that's sort of where I'm at. So it's about the same. And is it, what's like, where is the load where they, it, you've, you officially have been exposed to too much plutonium and What's the highest somebody would have? What are the number of figures? Well, they use all kinds of technical terms to, de to describe it, some of which are very difficult to comprehend. Uh, I can't remember all the terms. I haven't been involved in the business directly for a few years. But there are some terms like C-E-D-E, -E, and I can't remember exactly what that stands for, but it's really a 50-year dose. Mm -hmm. What your total dose is over 50 years of exposure. It's a lifetime dose, but it's really calculated at a 50-year exposure. My, my uh, C-E-D-E -E is 30 rem. There are people out there with, in the or were out there, uh, over 250, 300 in that range. And that, so if it's internal, it means you breathed it or ingested it? Yeah, and it became deposited typically in your lungs, although you could get it from a wound. Or you could eat it, but that's not as likely. Yeah. So you're, you're warned about that in the safety video? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, yes. If you um, didn't catch that part, you're in trouble yeah. to begin with. Uh, how did you feel about the way that safety issues were talked about in the media? Oh, I, I think the media tried to be fair about it. I'm not sure they always understood them. They didn't know everything they were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it was pretty technical, you know, like I was explaining with, I think CED is committed effective dose equivalent. Uh, that's what that term means. And it's not necessarily easily understood. And there's all kinds of dose equivalent terminologies. And uh, uh, you have to be a specialist to really understand it. And the press does the very best they can, but uh, they're not experts. And it's, it's hard for them. So I think they did, they tried in many cases to do their best and they did okay most of the time. Do you think you would feel differently about, do you think your exposure, having been exposed, um, makes you feel differently about safety issues than say, uh, you know, someone who's a manager who? Yeah, um, I'm probably a little more sensitive about it than than someone who came here five years ago and has never been inside of a process building. Because mm -hmm. they don't understand it any more than other people. I mean, some of them don't. Most of them don't. 
So I may be a little more sensitized to that fact, but I also understand it better than they do, and so I'm not scared of it. I know some people out there who are absolutely terrified of their job, and they work in a very nice office. Well, they're not terrified of their job. They're not comfortable with their surroundings. I'm overstating my case. Um, were you comfortable with security at the site, always? You know, I've only become familiar with security to any degree in the last 10, 12 years. Uh, security physical security, in other words, guards, guns, uh, that sort of thing, has been much more thorough than, than I really understood. The protection of classified information, I really, that was, for me, all the years, more of a nuisance. You know, it was a something bureaucratic that you had to deal with, a very necessary thing, but so I, I really don't know much about the classified part of it. The um, physical security I understand now, and I'm actually very impressed by it. Um, well, these are just a few wrap-up questions. I guess before I get to them, I wonder if there are any other um, events that happened at the plant that, that you remember and wish to share. You know, there's always been some discussion about the 903 pad, where the oils leaked onto the ground. And I don't know everything that went on there, because in those days I was an hourly person and didn't really deal with it directly. But again, that's one of those examples of the standards that existed, the money that was needed, and neither one of them were up to par and allowed a circumstance like that to happen. Um, certain entities there tried to get money so that they wouldn't be storing oil drums outside. And it was turned down at the congressional level. So we the people through our elected representatives allow that to happen. life story of Rocky Flats. Right. We the people don't blame ourselves when, when it comes out. Well, yeah, but how can you know? It's difficult. I mean, there, I'm sure there are similar situations throughout the country going on today. And... Uh, do you think, I mean, it's sort of an interesting... Th it, I think the American public, when something goes wrong, always wants to cast blame, wants to find someone. Yes. And so I guess this question was Rocky Flats a scapegoat, and then also was there anybody who was really responsible? Was there any point, do you think, in the history of the plant where someone said, I should do this, and then did, did the wrong thing? Where they could have done otherwise. They, you know, they're the person. <clears throat> On a major scale, I don't know of anything like that. It very well may have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know of any. I'm sure on a smaller scale we did it on a regular basis. Cutting corners. Cutting, Cutting corners. corners, yeah. But I don't know of it on a major scale, on a, a major project or a major emphasis kind of thing. And was Rocky Flats a scapegoat? I don't know. I. Sometimes they are their own worst enemy. Sometimes they were the guiltless victim. Um, in general, how did you feel about working in a plant that produced a key part of nuclear weapons? At this point in my life, I hope we do away with them completely throughout the whole world. Earlier in my career, when I was 20 years old, I didn't give it a lot of thought. Um, so I guess I would have to say that I really 
During most of my career, I never really thought too much about it. I remember getting into an argument with a guy one time who said, they're going to do away with our jobs. And I said, well, maybe they, be, maybe they should. Wouldn't the world be a better place? He didn't like that answer. Maybe the world would have been a better place if we didn't had, had not have existed or had not had the need to exist or had not been mandated by Congress to exist or whatever, <laughs> however we came to pass. Did you, I mean, was there a point, do you think the Cold War would have been won, quote unquote, um, without the weapons that Rocky Flats produced? It's hard to say for sure. I would say that Ronald Reagan pushed the Soviet Union into a real corner and maybe it was because we were there that he was able to do that. Wouldn't want to push that corner too hard, though. Um, what were the best things about working at Rocky Flats? The people. A lot of great people out there. Always has been. Friends for life. Met a lot of people. Meet with a lot of retirees off plant site. Um, company activities. I see a bunch of people you're glad to see. Enjoy the people all the time. And how about the um, worst or most difficult aspects of having a career at Rocky Flats? Hmm. I don't know. That one's hard to say. Rocky Flats has been very good to me. I'm going to retire here in a few months and I'm going to have a nice retirement. It's going to be great. There were some hard things to do out there, you know, some of the working conditions, you know, when you're wearing a respirator, respiratory protection, full face mask, eight hours. That's hard. It's tiring. It's not good for your spirits. It's hard to do. Some of the working conditions are very difficult. And they're harder now probably than they've ever been because there's a lot of people doing that. Fortunately, I'm not one of them. So is your, um, your job now with Wacken Hut is overseeing the safety mainly of the security force then? Of, of the security force, that's my job. And how much of it is radioactivity now? Very little, almost none mostly fire up safety, that kind of thing. Yes. Now that only happened when the last shipment of material went to Savannah River here a few months ago. Mm -hmm. Up to that point, our people were in the plutonium buildings. Now they're no longer there. Were in they, the buildings. They would be patrolling the buildings? Yes. So has your, um, your guard force must have been cut by quite a lot? Yes. At one point in time, there were over 300 guards out there, security guards. Security police officers is the correct title. Um, now there are 80, I believe. If the uh, elevated national security level goes down, there'll be half of that. It's like the orange terror? Yeah. The Homeland Defense Code Orange. Are we orange now or yellow? Uh, we're not orange. Whatever code we're at, I'm not sure. Yellow, yeah, I, I believe. Yeah, I think we're yellow. So, but that so under sort of pre-September 11th circumstances. Yes. And is your um, since you were a specialist in radiation, is this is a good time for you to retire then? Well, actually, my company's contract's going away. So are they all going to be gone? No, no, no. They're being absorbed by Kaiser Hill. Oh because it's getting to be such a small force, it's hard to justify a subcontractor to do that. Right. So um, how long total, you'll, it will be, it's 41 years? Mm -hmm. 41 years, April this year. 
And did you um, decide to join, when you retired from Rocky Flats, you retired in order to take, from the contract, in order to take a job at Wack and Hutt? I retired because they offered a, a buyout and a, a financial opportunity that I couldn't resist. And on my way out the door, Wack and Hutt was looking for a radiation safety uh, rad in, radiological engineer, and so I took that position. I was only 50 years old at the time and still needed to work, but I also needed to take advantage of that opportunity, so they both worked out. Will you miss going to the plant? Activity? No. Rocky Flats is not a particularly fun place anymore. It's pretty depressing from somebody that's spent a career there. I mean, I drive down Central Avenue, the main street and the plant site, and all the buildings are mostly gone. Uh, the infrastructure is going away. The water tower is being dropped. The sanitary sewer system will go away in not too distant future. The telephone system will be gone. We'll all be wearing cell phones. and Time to go. I'm ready. Um, anything else that you want to add? No, but it's kind of been interesting reliving some of this, I yeah. think. that's. I'll probably think of something as soon as I get out the door. Well, you can always uh, do another one. I wouldn't mind doing that if, if appropriate. Okay, let me see, um, we'll just make sure I didn't forget anything. Yeah, I think we've done it. So, um, okay, I will turn this off. Thank you very much for your time and participation. It was great.